All right, hello everybody, and welcome to the August edition of the San Francisco Computational Design Institute. Um, this is also the marks the four-year anniversary, so we'll talk about that in a second. But I um, wanted to welcome everybody here uh, to start off. So um, I want to make some announcements. You can sign up for our monthly announcements um, overall to, to keep in touch with what we're doing at um, sfcdi.org. This actually says something wrong. It should be cdi.org. Um, online attendees, if you're uh, attending the webinar, you're muted, please write questions in the chat panel and we'll be able to see them and then respond to them um, when it comes time for the Q&A. Uh, part of the plan for today was to also live stream this in 360. Um, unfortunately, we had a, a piece of missing equipment. So we, uh, we're not gonna be able to live stream it, um, uh, uh, I think for the whole time, but we'll be setting up in, in sort of the background. So hopefully we'll get some of that um, but uh, please do, if you're watching remotely, check out our, our, our YouTube channel either now or after to see some of those things. Um, one announcement is that there's a new group. Um, this is the, uh, with a name much longer than ours even, which is uh, the NorCal Building Virtual Information and Design and Modeling Construction Users Group. Um, and their, their uh, meeting will be on Wednesday, September 4th um, in, uh, in Roseville. Um, just uh, a little up the pike from from San Francisco, so you can check out their um, their uh, um, uh, you can Google them for that. So this is the four year anniversary of SFCDI. Um, we've had a couple of other names, um, of course, and we started off with the San Francisco Computational Design. Oops, sorry, nope, that was two names. The San Francisco Dynamo User Group, and the first the first meeting was four years ago this month, um, and. Uh, this is a screenshot from that very first uh, presentation. All these are still documented and still available back on the YouTube channel. Um, I like this one. This is uh, Cesar was showing uh, some adaptive components uh, use for a, a parking garage. And then that's our handy reminder to plug in or find another power source right there on the, um, I just like that, it's kind of cool. So um, there've been some really memorable events, I think at, at, uh, that we've been doing over the last four years. Uh, certainly there are a lot of firsts that you know of, of people um, different technologies that were announced first here that I, I think are, are fun to celebrate. Um, even our um, one of our prominent board members, Alberto uh, Tono, um, first found us on, online and uh, eventually moved to San Francisco and is a big part of why we're still doing well today. Um, so thank you everybody to have, the past presenters, to um, people who, um, everybody here who's been part of the community. Um, it's, it's been really fun and hope to continue for a long time. So now broaden our mission a bit to the, of course, the San Francisco Computational Design Institute. Um, and uh, so thank you. Um, in the back, um, we've got some uh, pizza as normal. And then to celebrate the occasion, we have some cupcakes also from, from across the street. So, um, so feature presentations today, uh, we're gonna talk, we're gonna hear about Autodesk Forge, which is a cloud platform. Um, we'll hear from Michael Beal, who's been a senior, uh, uh, engineer on at Autodesk for some time, and uh, he's been with some Forge for some time too, but in, in previously he's also with uh, the graphics team, um, large model viewer, home styler, um, and a few others in there too. Um, Michael has acted as, as an evangelist uh, too, which is kind of fun, close near and near to, to my heart, um, as, some, as, a, as a way to just you know, help lots of people use new technology. Um, so I don't, so uh, that'll be an exciting presentation. Another one is, uh, uh, by Devin Copley, uh, the CEO of iMeve is with us, and he'll be telling us about Avatour 360 remote presence. And um, that's really exciting too, um, in a lot of ways, and, and certainly they'll, they're looking to get more into the AC space, which is uh, very exciting, so welcome. And uh, so we'll get to these presentations in short order. I wanna thank our sponsors for the meeting space for the AIA uh, San Francisco, um, back up in the Holiday Building. Uh, lunch, thank you Autodesk uh, for providing lunch, for picking up the tab. Webinar, thank you, Gensler, for sponsoring our webinar, um, as, as always, and um, for, the, for the VR um, demo that we'll have um, for iMeve. So thank you very much, appreciate it. I'll hand it over to Michael. Hi, everyone. I'm gonna switch slides really quick. Sure, sure. Nope. Uh, my name is Michael Beale. I am on the Forge Evangelist team. So we, um, my team uh, evangelizes uh, this new platform we have. Um, we call it Forge. And uh, I've been with Autodesk for quite a while. I've uh, originally started in the research area, um, building products like HomeStyler, if anyone remembers that. It's now owned by a Chinese company. 
Um, all the way into the rendering services for rendering photorealistic renders and uh, stereo, panorama, stereo panorama services. And then over to large model viewing, doing large models. Um, I Since about two years ago, I joined the, uh, the Forge Evangelist team under Jim Quancy. Some of you guys may know Jim. Um, we, uh, let's see, uh, since, since joining the, the Forge team, you know, that sort of transition from sort of doing more research and into sort of customer facing role, um, it's been a lot of fun. I've, I've found a lot of insights as to what, what are the trends going on in the industry. And Colin and I were chatting up probably about a month ago, and we were talking about one of the, the trends that I was noticing around generative design. And it's, it's one of those things that you, I wasn't expecting to see. I'd be in these meetings um, talking about some of the, the prototypes that they were working on with Autodesk, um, Autodesk Technologies. And they would sort of mention, um, oddly enough, they would sort of talk about how they were really embracing generative design. And that wasn't, it was a little bit unexpected because they were, um, they weren't your traditional companies for doing that. So it was clear to me and seeing it from completely different pockets of the industry, uh, it was clear to me that this was this was something that was gaining more and more mo momentum. So uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's Autodesk Dynamo or whether it's Grasshopper, it's, it's, it's definitely something that um, I'm seeing more of. So first of all, let's talk about what is Forge, because that's kind of, that's kind of why I'm here. Um, Autodesk Forge um, essentially is Autodesk's cloud offering. Autodesk traditionally provides authoring tools, desktop-based authoring tools. And we took some of those geometry engines and those algorithms and we wrapped them up and we put them in the cloud. And then we attached APIs in front of them so you, it would be accessible to a wider, a wider audience, not just Autodesk. So Forge is the branding around that, that story. So if you can imagine taking that engine from say AutoCAD and then taking the, uh, you know, the, what's the word, the, the computational um, algorithms from Maya or, or 3D Studio Max, um, you've got all these separate little pieces that are kind of like Lego bricks and you've got some storage like a Revit file. Um, if you could somehow mash these pieces together, kind of like you give, you know, kind of like you give your kids Lego a big, Big, uh, big bag of Lego, you you give that to them and they can build something creative with it. This is kind of the same concept. You can take these modules, these pieces, and piece them together, integrate them together, and you can build something that's a little, a little bit more than the sum of its parts. So Forge itself, we kind of dog food this. We have a platform we call BIN360. Um, we also have A360 and Fusion team all sort of very similar uh, storage formats, but for different industries. BIM 360s targeting the um, you know, architectural design um, space. And um, like, like all good products uh, and hero products, you wanna make sure it's working so you dog food this. So if the Forge platform um, is the underlying component of BIM 360. If that's gonna work, maybe not. It's decided to stop. Oh, let's try it again. It was too fast. There we go. Um, so BIM 360 sits on top of Forge. Um, the components of Forge, so things like identification to be able to log in and identify, um, object storage or file storage, um, you know, derivative services to be able to convert things from one file format to, the, to another, um, and also sort of event management thing. So when something happens, something triggers, um, a job completes, it can trigger an event through a webhook. Now piecing all of this together um, into um, solutions that provide things like insights. So I wanna provide a dashboard that can provide um, a cost analysis of what's going on. Actually, I'll, just going back to that previous slide, um, you know, you'd have things like design collaboration, you'd have cost management, planning and scheduling. Those are sort of the derivatives of uh, once you piece all these modules together. So I'm gonna to talk about two things. I'm gonna talk about an example of insights. 
I'll do that pre, I'll try to keep that brief and then I'll pivot over to automation. And that's kind of where it gets more interesting with generative design um, and automation um, to be able to, to come up with many, many iterations of a design um, for analysis. So typically you have lots of different file types, uh, IFC files, Revit files, SketchUp, DWG, um, and you want to provide some sort of, say, cost estimation. Uh, you want to you want to get some kind of takeoff as to what this is going to um, potentially cost. So having um, having having an insight to what what something might cost could influence your design. And the Forge platform helps connect those pieces together. Ultimately, you're having this concept of data at the center instead of being siloed off into different areas. So if you've got your CAD and design files in one area and your engineering files in another space and maybe cost and scheduling information in an essay in a in some sort of cost data database um, using web services um, and tying together the, with the forge platform you can connect those silos together and have essentially this I, this concept of data at the center we, um i don't know if anyone here was at um, au um, just last year 2018 anyone yes Okay, there's a couple people. Um, there was this great slide. Um, it was a great slide from Andrew who talked about data gravity. And this concept is, is exactly that. Traditionally, your files sit on a desktop. And as people have found more and more use cases where we collaborate better, the data is shifting from these dispersed places to some central place. And they call that data gravity. So how do you get started with Forge? Um, Typically, these are web-based tools. So if you've got any knowledge of things like you know, Node.js or maybe you're doing some C-sharp work, some HTML, CSS, JavaScript, they're the sort of typical things you'll hear and use to, um, to use the Forge platform. To give you a quick idea of an example of, say, an insight, um, a dashboarding system, JE Dunn, we, we're using uh, the Forge information, or I should say they're, they're building information um, to come up with cost estimations early on, which would influence the, the top the top down um, decision making. So, for example, they could um, they could take, for example, the volume of columns or walls and see its material, calculate its volume, and then tie that with their cost their cost database um, to get a rough estimation of of the cost of this this design and then compare it to different suppliers. So classic kind of takeoff sort of work, but tying it with um, the model itself. Uh, another example in the industry, Google, um, sort of they're storing their, their design files in BIM 360, and then they're, they're trying to solve, as Google does very efficiently, they try to solve uh, the industry problem of disconnected data. We design things, we then pre-construct and construct things, build them, and then finally, we hand these things off to operation. That's that digital twin concept. Um, Google used the Forge platform to tie those three silos of data together and try to, to, try to keep, um, try to avoid that problem of remodeling data and throwing data away and recreating it. It's just a really quick overview of what that was all about. Um, Forge has been used by plenty of partners. You, you might even see your name in here. I know we've got HOK here. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else is out here, um, but plenty of partners um, recently working with Nor Consult on some rebar stuff, for example. Um, so let me give you some, some quick examples of some fun insights. So previously, I was on the, the viewing team, the large model viewing team. So for me, it's fun to always show off what the viewer can do. This is the Forge viewer. It's um, basically taking the the 3D geometry that you've created through either something like Inventor or Fusion or Revit and displaying in a browser really, really easily. This is a customized view. This is an example of I want to I want to show my my design publicly, um, and you know I want I want to restyle everything to make it look like it's a gallery. Then I can provide you know custom buttons, maybe some custom animation, um, and you know do some fun things like you know separate all the parts out. But also one of the key parts of, of the Forge platform is, is the metadata, not just the geometry. So I can click on a, a, a part here and I can find uh, I can find all of this information for this particular this particular object. 
And that very simple concept expands out to those um, more interesting use cases around insights. Another example is when you take that, that same model data and you have a, a business that does say simulation, you can use the Forge platform as your conversion tool to provide a, a, a business around converting um, converting models into your simulation engine and then providing um, uh, results in 3D. So an example of that is a company called Simulation Hub. Um, they provide all, all sorts of different simulations. I'm gonna show you this quick one really, this little one here. This is a, a manifold, engine manifold, and they're just gonna do a CFD analysis. So they took the they took the um, took this 3D part, which you know came from one of the Autodesk um, authoring tools. I think this was I think this was Fusion, um, but um, they took the 3D model. They, they then um, using Forge, and then they applied it into their uh, the simulation engine. And then using the Forge viewer, they combined that 3D data with their resulting simulation data. And they did some really cool stuff with that because it's based on web technologies. I don't know if anyone's familiar with 3JS. Um, they got the results out of that simulation engine, which are a bunch of you know floating point vectors and um, 3D points, and uh, combined it into the 3D model as 3JS cylinders and provided this really nice visual of animation of what's going on. So the results now aren't just numbers, it's this three-dimensional visualization. Um, and they can provide it on the web, it's distributable, and um, they can. it's very repeatable. A customer can upload their a different manifold and perform the same um, computation. And that's provided them a business. Um, a little bit more on the operational side of things is a company called Aviva. So if you've got um, you've got a 3D model or Revit design, I might just show the video. I think we've got time. Um, I'll just flip down to not that video. This video. Um, I've either take the 3D model, um, which they've which they've gotten from the architect. Um, and um, they provide that sort of operational uh, operations management information. So if I've got a, an airport, for example, and I want to collect, I want to overlay all of the sensor information. So for example, in this room here, there's, um, there's uh, cooling and heating controls, there's lighting controls, there's some, probably some cameras. Um, Aviva ties those sensors together and provides them in a three-dimensional view from the Revit building. It, it pieces those two things together and then provides some tooling around that for um, a way to control the sensors remotely um, if, you know, for management purposes. This, uh, this is a little bit of a contrived example of um, you know, there's some sort of smoke that's uh, occurred, uh, something's failed, some sort of ventilation systems failed. Um, it's triggered uh, heat sensors um, and they quickly take a photograph with it using the CCD cameras and then they send the issue to operations and maintenance for them to go and fix. Just a quick example. Okay, so. So Forge, it's got lots of different services. I've sort of briefly touched on the viewing side of things, how to view something in, in the browser. Um, we also have file conversion services, that's model derivative. Um, be able to convert from one thing to another. But the one that I wanted to talk more about today was around design automation. And I'll skip through those. Design automation, um, it's, one of, it's one of our newer APIs. And it's, it's, it started off with design automation for AutoCAD. Um, that's, that's in production today. Um, and it's a way of taking, your, um, or taking the AutoCAD engine, um, cutting off its head so it's headless, and putting that on Amazon cloud services. So you can run uh, your jobs, your commands, your files through this engine. That's it in a nutshell. And then it's specifically targeted around batch jobs. So if there's anything that has a user interface, 
that's not what design automation's um, for. This is more for batch operations. Work locally with the UI, prepare everything in something where you, you need to now automate that in a batch process. Maybe you want to export PDFs. Um, prepare it locally and then create an automation batch script to produce thousands of PDF files from a Dweek file, for example, and stick a logo on it. Uh, that's one very quick example. Something that's been more interesting um, is design automation for Revit. Um, doing the same thing we did with AutoCAD, we took the, the Revit engine, the, the Revit with user interface, we took, off the, took out the user interface and we created a headless Revit, and then we put that up into the cloud as well. Now where this gets kind of more interesting for generative design is if you can control that engine programmatically, you can come up with thousands of iterations of a design. Now, granted, we've been talking about what is the, the future for, for Dynamo. Um, I have word from different sources, but I do know that there is, uh, on a, on, there is a roadmap to put not only Revit in the cloud and have that working, which we do today, but um, adding different modules. And one of those modules would be Dynamo. So you'd be able to take your Dynamo um, node graph and to be able to run that in with a set of parameters to be able to, um, to produce multiple uh, generative design outputs in a batch process. So what I do is I've got a couple of examples, just a couple of videos of, uh, of, of where design automation for Revit's being used in the creation process. So one really simple example, um, a French company, construction company, we're using Revit um, for the project initialization component. So they have a they have a template design of a building, um, a, a simple building here, but they have you know five or six different projects with slightly different configurations of that building. So using design automation for Revit, they created this simple web prototype web page where uh, where they took that template and using the web page tweaked a few of the parameters and then sent that as a batch job to design automation to create a new version of that building with a slightly different you know, width, a slightly different number of levels or floors, um, and um, producing Revit assets for their designers and, and um, for their, their project teams to work with. Let's go to the next one. Uh, is there anyone here working with Revit families? Yep, one, two, three. Okay, we, okay, you know what I'm talking about? Good. Um, so Revit Families was one of the, the big requests for design automation for Revit. Um, can, does, can design automation for Revit do Revit Families? The answer is yes. So if you have, for example, this uh, window, um, say it's a, it looks like it's a gelled window. Window, um, window double hung, I create a type, I change the height, the width, et cetera. And then I basically tell it to generate this new Revit family. Um, I hit the play button after I select the class, the frame material type, and I come up with a family name. Slowly. And then finally I hit the create button. Oh, it's an RFA file, there we go. I just had to put that in. Select a destination folder. Um, so this user interface was created by one of the other guys on my team, um, Jaron. So if you have any Revit family questions with design automation for Revit, I have very limited knowledge and that's my go-to guy. So it hits the create button and this essentially submits this, uh, gets those parameters, it gets um, a, a base template Revit and starts generating a new Revit family RFA file. And that's gonna take a little while. I think then he opens it up in, oh yeah, it, uh, it saves it to BIM 360 in this case, and then he just loads this up into Revit. Woohoo, there it is, fun, okay. All right. Okay, so for the last the last kind of video I'm going to show before I um, talk a little bit more about how to play around with um, creation is um, it's a little demo we did just to sort of this is something you don't really want to do so don't take take this demo with a grain of salt 
Um, this is this demo is called Sketch It. It's one of our samples um, to play around with. Uh, essentially, what it does is it it's a it's a browser-based 2D sketch program, um, and what it does is it sets up some vectors for lines, etc., and then creates a set of Revit commands for creating walls and floors, um, and submits that to Revit, which then generates a Revit file displays it in a browser through Forge conversion services and the Forge viewer, and at the same time, gives you a, a Revit file, which I think this is gonna show. Um, it's also dropped some, you know, it's, it's got some cute stuff here for dropping objects in the scene. Um, let's see. So this is all done in the Forge viewer. It looks cool. That's it's kind of, where is the actual Revit model? Ah, okay. Um, I don't have that video here. It's embarrassing. Wrong video. Um, how, much, how much time have we got? Still? Okay. Um, so last but not least, to get started, let's say you wanted to do a rooms and spaces analysis. Um, we've got a, um, down in Sydney, at the Sydney Accelerator, we had um, one, one architectural firm put together a whole series of things to, to piece this together. They took, um, this is a sample, this is the advanced basic sample. Um, took that Revit file, used the sample project called Rooms and Spaces, um, and it would take a Revit file and analyze it for rooms and spaces and then produce this um, um, additional layer inside Revit um, containing the just the bounding box rooms. Then inside the Forge viewer, um, we cr he created this um, analysis system to be able to say, you know, I want to see what the flow of traffic is going to be, you know, or the occupancy of, of these particular rooms. And maybe we'll change the shape of these rooms slightly um, to um, um, affect that occupancy level. So it's a sort of a basic space analysis. And then, right, last one. I knew I was getting to it. Uh, this is the GitHub repo. Like all of the Forge projects, they have a GitHub repo. This is the repo for this one that I've just showed you, Rooms and Spaces, Revit plugin. It's, again, targeted around occupancy analysis um, and um, being able to send jobs up and, uh, sorry, being able to send this job up to Re uh, Design Automation for Revit and get this information back for doing analysis. Um, has anyone heard of Project Refinery from Keen Wellmsley. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now I know the sub and uh, the the group here. Um, extending that room occupancy analysis. Um, the, the Autodesk built the Toronto a new location in Toronto, and Keen Wellmsley was on the um, on that team to do the uh, to do an analysis of it under the research umbrella. So he used Dynamo to essentially do. Um, uh, an analysis of different, um, just what I was showing you before, occupancy analysis, come up with different configurations. Uh, let me show you the video. Wrong one, this one. It's such a pretty video. So essentially this 2D floor plan um, generate uh, some arrangements for where people could sit um, and based on that simulate path and um, just speeding this video up a little bit. Here we go. Took, uh, uh, simulated the occupancy and then started coming up with different configurations. Eventually, um, eventually they, they narrowed it down to a few designs, uh, tens of thousands of designs, I suppose, um, and then came up with um, came up with a, a final result. Have you have you guys seen the article? It sounds like some of you already have. Okay. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that. It's and I'm, I'm, I'm now officially out of my uh, out of time. Autodesk's um, Autodesk Forge has uh, an accelerator program, and that's kind of where we have a hackathon for a week. Uh, the next one's in New York City um, next week and a half, and I'll be there. Um, essentially, it's a hackathon. If you've got a prototype or something that you want to try out with the Forge platform, um, you can sign up on Eventbrite. Uh, or go to the actual Autodesk Forge Accelerator homepage. Um, and um, 
and you yeah, take a look and then submit a proposal and hopefully we can get get you in unfortunately the new york city one has um it is full that one's pretty popular but we have others so there's a list of them uh, just down here and you can see there i, I know uh, we've had alberta come along to one of one of uh, we've had a few of you guys actually come along to uh, the forge accelerators this is one from boston just um just recently and that is it there's one coming up in san francisco with that i'll hand it back over questions. yeah uh, no i think we're good thank you michael okay, great. Um, i'll point out to those two people who are listening I, we'll take one question in the room that's good and i want to point out to people who are listening that the live stream is up on our on our youtube channel and uh you got one question from dave yeah i, I was wondering like if someone wants to get started um if you look at documentation via API, uh, what's the best way to do that? And second, uh, what is the cost model for using the service? How is it calculated? Like if a company wants to budget for it, what's, how, how do you go about that? Yeah, that's a good. Two good questions. Um, the first one, a little bit easier. Um, so go to um, developer.autodesk.com um, or forge.autodesk.com specifically for Forge. And that will take you to um, essentially all of the information, all of all of the things that I've been presenting, um, all of the source code and resources for sample code, et cetera, how to get started. Um, and also has a, a pricing page. So if I just quickly show you that. So I'll just go to forge.autodesk.com. And under pricing, it gives you, um, it essentially gives you the, the details here. So for um, if your customer is storing files on BIM 360, then all file conversion happens automatically as part of their subscription, so it's free. Uh, if you're using Forge buckets and you're specifically not, your customers uh, don't have an Autodesk account and you're, you're essentially storing their data for them or you're doing conversion for them, any, um, any file that you convert is what we call a cloud credit. So for simple files like AutoCAD files, it's 0.2 cloud credits per file. Um, or for a Navisworks file, something more significant, it's 1.5. Uh, design automation, it's um, per second billing, but the model itself is four cloud credits per hour. So if you're processing a lot of stuff, or sorry, if you're only pro processing one thing that only takes a few seconds, then the cost of that is very tiny. It's 0.01 or something like that. But um, that's this is the page where you can find that information. For a developer to get started, they, do they need to have cloud credits available? Good question. Um, so when you first sign up, um, you get 100 cloud credits for free. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Great. Thank you. Not save your slides. That's okay. Okay. Okay, so you have to accept me making it a bit better. Okay. You're good to go. Okay. Thanks. Also, eat cupcakes. There are tons of cupcakes over there. <laughs> And you can take my if you need a power cord. Okay. Okay, great. Oh, that's right. Um, what is, oh, do I also have to plug in? Yeah. Okay, let me get that. Cool. Uh, here? Where do I plug in? There should be an HDMI somewhere. Do you know where the HDMI is? Uh, there's no HDMI. Okay. You have to do the uh, share thing, which is right here. Right here. Right. Oh, it's through my computer. No, it's Miracast? Microphone. Yeah. So I've got a Mac, right? Yeah. And so if you go to, um, if you log into the uh, Wi Fi presenter, Okay. It's about, it's about six seconds. <laughs> All right, Wi-Fi presenter. Yeah. 
present it yeah. is. And I can't remember the password. It's something, something, one, two, three. Where is it? There it is. Um, AIA, one, two, three. We need to go figure that out. Nice job. Wow. And then what's going to happen is um, the air, <clears throat> air, um, airplay is going to appear. Okay. So if you click on the airplay and then look for, I think it was that one. Let's see what happens. I might have to disconnect. Hang on. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> nice. Except. And that's what that's what everybody else sees. Yeah. There we go. Is that working? No. Uh -uh. That's so we're seeing the presenter screen. I'm thoroughly confused. Okay. There we go. Oh, we're good. All right, but how do I get rid of this? Yeah. All right, we're all we're all set up. Um, so this is uh, uh, Devin Copley of iMeet. Hi, Rudy. I think we're all set up. <laughs> um, thanks a lot for having me here today. Um, I am pretty new to the world of uh, computational engineering and design. Um, I actually had the good fortune to connect with Alberto at HOK, who invited me after you know learning about what we do, um, invited me to come by and introduce our product to you. So um, I'm really uh, grateful for the opportunity, and thanks to Colin as well for helping get set up. And um, uh, eager to get some feedback from you guys on what we're uh, in the process of bringing to the market. A um, little bit of background on our company. Um, Emiv is uh, made up of a bunch of uh, engineers and product designers who have been pioneers in the field of virtual reality. Um, we mostly came out of a program at Nokia, um, which built the world's first 360 camera, the Nokia Ozo. Uh, and since then, uh, since January of 2018, we've been a startup sort of taking some of that work and extending it. Um, we are responsible for some of the largest and highest profile live 360 events that have been done to date. Um, we did the, uh, we provided the technology, we're not a production company, but a technology company. We provided the tech for the UEFA Champions League finals three years running um, back in 2016. That was uh, the first time anyone had ever done it. Um, and uh, in the last, year and a half, we've been moving past the one-to-many broadcast paradigm towards a uh, communications approach and to be able to do what we call remote presence. The problem we're solving is getting the right people to the right place. Um, when you want to talk about a place with other people, and that is to say a real place, not a, um, not a CAD design, um, there is a real challenge in getting everybody there. It's quite simple. Um, travel is currently the best way to talk about a place together. Um, on the one hand, you can go through all the trouble and expense of flying everybody to the place so you can talk about it. On the other hand, you have FaceTime, which is not a very effective way of communicating what a space is about and being able to discuss it. Um, we've created a platform that essentially sort of extends the, the video conferencing paradigm into 360 and VR. Um, we essentially allow you to visit a place remotely and talk to the people who are there. The cloud platform for multi-party immersive remote presence. Multiple remote users can join local users in a real place. We use we do 360 capture with a setup like this. This is a uh, inexpensive consumer grade 360 camera, costs about $400, and a phone. And um, between these. Um, you can capture and, uh, and broadcast uh, a space in real time and then have your remote users appear on the screen here for you to interact with them and, uh, and see what they're looking at. So remote users can use either a, uh, 
a VR headset like this. Um, this is an Oculus Go. It's uh, about two hundred dollars. Um, or uh, cardboard, which is $5 and just wraps around your phone, or any browser. You don't need a headset to participate. Um, if you just use a browser, it's very similar to a Zoom or a Skype, except you have a 360 view of the sort of host location. So when we say remote presence, people sometimes think of what Cisco markets as telepresence um, with their $200,000 rooms with giant screens and, 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 and people behind desks. This is not what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. And let's see if I can get this to actually run. There we go. I don't know if you can hear this. But um, so this is an example of what the experience is like from inside the headset. This is a real estate example where we have a, um, a, uh, a real estate agent who's taking a, a couple on a tour of an apartment. Um, the couple are in two separate physical locations elsewhere in the country, um, but they are able to talk to him and talk to each other in real time and be able to witness what this space looks like and ask the, uh, the, uh, the agent um, to sort of walk them in, in one direction or another. Now you can see um, the, 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 the system that he's got. He has a Bluetooth headset and he has essentially, well, you can't see the camera itself, but he's got his phone and a camera on a selfie stick, just like you see here. And uh, if users join within headsets, they appear like this as avatars to each other. Um, if you join on a, on a browser, it turns on your webcam and you appear as a sort of a postage stamp video. We do rotate the postage stamp to show where you're looking. So this is a little um, just sort of block diagram about what the platform is, how it works. Um, on the host side, you've got Bluetooth headset, consumer grade camera, and a phone or tablet. Um, uplink is important. Uh, we do require essentially a minimum of about six megabits up. Um, so that can be a challenge. We are working closely with telcos from our, our background with Nokia. We have good relationships with telcos around the world. Um, we just finished just this week uh, working with Sprint on their launch of their 5G network. Uh, where we demonstrated this system using production 5G equipment up and down to get uh, higher bandwidth and higher quality. But if you have a good LTE connection, or certainly if you have Wi-Fi at the location, um, it's quite viable. From there, it's our cloud service. Um, the cloud service provides low latency video distribution. It provides the social interaction, which includes serialization of the avatars and voice chat, as well as a scheduling service so that you can arrange to meet people at some point in the future. Um, up to five remote guests can join using a phone, tablet, or an HMD. Target markets. Now, we are getting started um, right now with our market engagement. Um, we have um, some, uh, we have uh, beta participants in the real estate space. Um, Compass is working with us, Better Homes and Gardens. Um, we've started chatting with uh, folks in the AC space. It's not quite as far along. Um, we are talking to HOK, um, we're talking with uh, uh, Thornton Tomasetti in New York. Um, but uh, our, our main goal right now is not so much to uh, sell a lot of um, you know, commercial offering so much as to get feedback. Um, we think this is a tool that potentially has a lot of value um, to the construction engineering architecture industries. Um, but I'll be the first to admit our team are not experts in that space at all. Um, and we want to learn from the people who are. So we want to be able to get this tool in the hands of people who are going to use it and give us some feedback. Um, our focus initially is on these two B2B markets, real estate and AEC. Um, but we do think this is a broadly applicable technology um, that has a wide variety of use cases, especially as uh, headsets become uh, more common in the future. So for AEC, just sort of zooming in on this space, this is what we understand to be valuable use cases based on the conversations we've had. I think um, I would love to chat with any of you guys afterwards if you think there are other things we should be adding to this list. And particularly if you think you know, there's a group within your companies who might be interested in, in participating in the beta program. Um, obviously, client walkthroughs, um, there, there's you know, cost and timing issues, there's safety issues. Um, it can be possible to have more frequent uh, or less expensive um, client feedback um, if you can do it virtually like this. 
um, joint review of recorded walkthroughs, the use of recorded walkthroughs for uh, documentation, um, internal progress reviews, the ability to bring in an, an expert who you know might you might otherwise have to bring to the site and have him say, oh, you know, what's this, you know, what's this existing condition here that we weren't expecting? Um, what do you want to do about it? Um, that those kinds of things, and you know, potentially even uh, inspections. Um, real estate, I think, may be less less of interest to the folks in this room, um, but we, we we're already seeing a variety of use cases there. We have an alpha that's in the hands of a few users right now. We are literally releasing the beta momentarily. Um, we have a small, a limited number of slots in our beta program. We're only about 10 people, so we can only handle a, a certain number of users. We have five five um, beta participants right now, so we've got room for a few more. Um, and uh, like I said, if you if your team is one of them or might be interested, please chat with me later. Um, the uh, general availability we're targeting for early next year, and it'll be on a SaaS platform basis, very similar to the way you buy Zoom uh, per seat with a with a, a usage cost as well. Um, so with that all said, I thought I would show you a quick demo. Um, so while I'm setting this up, uh, I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any any questions about the uh, the platform. Have you noticed seven people waving in your general direction? Yes, I think I think they're waving at the uh, live stream. Yeah. I was doing it too. <laughs> yeah, YouTube has a pretty long uh, latency, and um, that's in fact one of the one of the bigger challenges of what we're trying to do. Right, we have to keep the late the overall latency end to end down below one and a half seconds or so in order to be able to have uh, a reasonable conversation. And to do 4K video at one and a half seconds or less anywhere in the world is, is quite quite challenging. Um, but we're, we're able to do it. So I'm just logging into the platform now. Are you able to take oh. advantage of cellular uh, mobile networks when, you are, when there isn't Wi-Fi available in some cases? Yeah. Sites. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think, as I said, Uplink is um, Uplink is a, is a challenge. Um, I have to log into the Wi-Fi here now that we talk about it. Uh, I think I got it. Um, there we go. Um, but we can drop the bandwidth um, to six megabits or lower, which is usually feasible over um, over LTE networks. Um, so, yeah, exactly. Well, 5G is actually going to help in urban areas quite a lot. I mean, we were seeing, you know, in our tests with, with Sprint, you know, we were seeing, you know, 40 megabits up and 600 down in some cases. So it's, um, it, 5G 